How often have you gazed spellbound at a beautiful sunrise or a beautiful sunset? Ever? Every time it comes up, doesn't it? It's fantastic. It's wonderful. Or then, sometime late March, early April, that first swoop of the swallow through the garden. Yes? yes? It's absolutely stunning. Hey, he was in your garden or somewhere near, nesting this time last year. And he's just flopped off to South Africa. And he's come back to the same nest space. Or the swans and the geese in the winter. Or on a clear winter's night, you've looked out at the sheer wonder of the stars and the whole of the universe. It's staggering, isn't it? Or then in spring, when the first snowdrop comes up, or the first crocus. Or perhaps on an autumn after evening or an autumn morning when you look outside and you see the spectacular beauty of the sunlight dancing on a spider's web that's still got dew on it. It's spectacular. Now I could go on and on and on because if you think of the wonder of the way we're made the way our brains function, the way the nerves work, the way the blood circulates through the body, the way that the tiny acorn becomes a huge oak tree, cleansing the air and giving space and home for hundreds of thousands of little animals, little bugs, little beasts, everything. There are so many things in God's created order that are just quite, quite fantastic. And we do well to marvel at them, to praise them, to allow them to touch our hearts, to thrill us and to excite us. And do you remember last week, Harry was talking about this wonderful world that God has created. And then in the ultimate act of creation, he put mankind to be in charge of it to look after it. God said, let us make man in our image, after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over the livestock and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. And so God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him, male and female, he created them. And all that God created, he saw as being very good. And the man and the woman looked after God's creation. And Harry then went on to outline how God gave the man and the woman personal responsibilities for doing their work in looking after God's garden. And there was an agreement between God and Adam and Eve, about that work. But we all know what happened next. Between them, the man and the woman decided that they were not going to do what God had told them to do. They broke the terms of the agreement and they got kicked out of the garden. Everything was going wrong because of their actions. And do you know, ever since then, one way and another, we have been reaping the whirlwind. Led on by a desire for that which is better. Be it that delicious looking apple, or anything else we care to mention. Anything that's going to make us happier, more comfortable, safer, better protected. Whatever it is, we have gone after it and frequently gone after it with a vengeance. 
You know, in the 1860s, there were literally millions of buffalo that, rain, that roamed the North American Great Plains. Vast herds of them. And within 30 years, man in his wisdom had reduced them to a few hundred. Shot them, slaughtered them, butchered them, piled them up, left the carcasses to rot because he wanted the buffalo hides and the fur. A wanton destruction on the animals that had travelled up and down the North American plains for centuries and centuries, wiped out effectively in 30 years. Greed. And what about our favourite cod and chips? Yes, did you know that the biggest cod caught has weighed 50 kilograms? That's about 100 weight in old money. But today, fishing in the North Sea and off the Dogger Bank in Newfoundland is strictly limited. And why? Because we produced huge ships that will vacuum them up and we have wiped or we have reduced the stock to a point where it is barely coping. I remember as a kid going up to see the herring fleet in Great Yarmouth that came down every October, November time. Gone. Great Yarmouth now makes its money out of supplying North Sea or, uh, wind turbines and things, but not the herring fleet. Why? Because the herring aren't there, because man has overfished. Just that simple. And what did the reading from Hosea tell us? The prophet's judgment on Israel for breaking their covenant relationship with God has not changed. No acknowledgement of God in the land, only cursing, lying, murder, stealing and adultery. And the consequence? The land mourns. And all who live in it waste away. The beasts of the field, the birds of the air and the fish of the sea they're all dying. Now we know that story. We hear it every day. We may not like it, but it is absolutely real. God gave us responsibility to look after his world and instead we have plundered it. And we're all responsible. We can't just blame the big corporates for it and the governments. Every time we throw that plastic bottle away without thinking, it goes underground, it breaks down, and eventually the little bits get into the water systems, and then they go into the sea, and then they get picked up by the tiny fish, the tiny animals in the sea, and they die. This month, we are spending our time thinking about God's created environment. God's created order, the environment, the world around us. And today, it's my lot to think about where it's all gone wrong. And our role, your role, my role, in where it's all gone pear-shaped. The news has been awash with related stories to do with climate change and climate warming. warming. Right through the summer, there have been floods right, left and centre. Some of the worst in Germany, but they've been right around the world and there are endless videos about them. Even in places you wouldn't expect, like in the sands of the Middle East, in Saudi Arabia and Oman and places like that. The scientists are quite clear global warming is happening. It's on our watch. And the subtle changes can be seen all around us. 
and they have devastating effects. But I needn't go on about that because it's there every day in front of us in the news. The evidence that it's all gone wrong is just too clear. But the big question is what are we going to do about it? Now in March this year, I, in a mad moment, volunteered to be the environment officer for St. James's Church. Now I've long been interested in the environment and of man's impact on it. Do any of you remember a book entitled Silent Spring? Rachel Carson. It was written in 1962. And Rachel Carson was a journalist and a scientist who was alarmed at what she saw happening around her. The book, in many ways, was well ahead of its time. And she took on the chemical companies, the chemical industries, because they were providing copious amounts of disinformation. Pesticides are good. They kill the bugs and the beasts. They'll give us a much better lifestyle. There won't be the midges, there won't be the mosquitoes, there won't be this, there won't be that. I was struck by her analysis of things because as the DDT that was the target of the book became prevalent, my father, who was a very keen bird watcher, was noting that he rarely saw Sparrowhawk. Why? Because the DDT got into the system and eventually it fed through the food chain and for the Sparrowhawk and all the other raptors, their shells became, th of their eggs they laid, became thinner and thinner. And as the shells became thinner, so they failed to breed. And so there wasn't a following generation. And their numbers crashed. DDT was fine. It killed the mosquitoes. It killed the midges. The side effect long term was it knocked out the predators at the top of the food chain. And Rachel Carson wrote about that. What was the consequence of her book? Within 10 years, DDT had been banned as a usable substance. It still hung on in all sorts of squiff sort of sprays and things, but it was basically banned. Here was someone who'd done something. They'd realized what was wrong, they'd spoken up, they'd acted, and there were consequences. Those sort of pesticides were outlawed. But at the same time, a few years later anyway, what was going on in Vietnam? Well, we won't worry about DDT, we'll use Agent Orange. Which may well have led on to other problems. Well, it, all, it did. Once they started using it on cattle to disinfect them, we got BSE. That's actually gone as well. My interest in the environment was, was sparked by Rachel Carson's book. And I remember vividly, I was looking the other day, a photograph just sitting there on the chair in the garden, three yards from the house, a magnificent sparrowhawk beady-eyed, looking around the garden, and he was going to have one of the sparrows, for sure. The population's recovered because action was taken. The birds have recovered, but they're under enormous threat now. And if you cast your mind back over the years of what you don't now see very often at all, if at all, from when you were young.
I lost sight of the yellow hammers, which I saw regularly cycling to work when I lived in Lincolnshire. They disappeared about by 2002, 2003. Huge acreages of land cleared with the pesticides that the farmers now treat on the fields. We have to have food, but there was a, pay, a price to be paid. Their food, the Yellowhammer's food, disappeared. So what's all this mean for us as we come to the COP26 Intergovernmental Conference that starts on the 31st of October? What decisions will the world leaders make? Whatever they decide, you and I have all got a part to play. However big or small their decisions, we have our parts to play. We have to acknowledge we and our ancestors have got it wrong in a lot of things. But what are we going to give to our children? And more particularly, our grandchildren. What sort of world are they going to grow up in? And what about our great-grandchildren? Because if the projections are right, our great-grandchildren in 2060, 2080 are going to be in the heat of the climate warming. Earlier this year, the PCC completed a little questionnaire produced by a group called Oroca. They're a Christian charity committed to the protection and restoration of the natural world and to equipping Christians and churches to care for the environment. And this is the bit where you and I are immediately impacted as to what we might be doing. The questionnaire covered worship, teaching, buildings, land, community, and global engagement and lifestyle. If you want to see a copy of it, I can help you to find one. Or if you are able to go online, look up Aroca, A-R-O-C-H-A, and go to Eco Church, and you'll find it there. And out of that questionnaire, there is so much that we can all be doing and particularly in things like lifestyle. On the church buildings, they talk about double glazing and properly insulating the roof. But I know Kevin would think that that is a project that is at least three stages too far for the church finances at the moment, since we can barely pay our way. It really is a challenge that we probably cannot meet. But walking to church instead of getting our car out, for some that's possible, many do it. Great! Tick one box. Sharing a lift to church. Perhaps that's something we could look at. Reducing our own individual energy consumption, and we'll all be turning the thermostat down two or three degrees this year, this winter, because the current rise in gas prices will guarantee it even if nothing else does. But even if it doesn't, they say one degree will make a difference. And then there's reducing waste. Reusing things. Recycling. Do we really try to minimize what goes into landfill? Do we as individuals at home do we as a church community really try to limit things? Do we use fair trade and ethically sourced foods? How far do we go with that? Is it just food or is it other goods as well? You know what Prince Charles runs his Aston Martin on, don't you? A mixture of whey and waste wine products with 15% petrol. 
And that car's been running for 52 years. He was slightly ahead of the game. We have a long way to go to catch up. Now, I could go on and on with this list. But you all know what I'm talking about. It's like the mustard seed from the parable. From tiny beginnings, we can achieve really big things. We didn't do very well on the Eco Church survey, but there are several churches in the area that have already achieved a bronze standard in this, and they're going for silver. Do nothing, and we can be left behind. Do something, and we're beginning to make an impact on God's world, on the world in which we live, and the world in which our children and descendants will live. If we can only do a very little, then we can begin, just begin, to put right those things that have gone wrong in the past. And we're all aware of how beautifully black Bradford was 50 years ago. And it all came because of a greed to have smoke, coal-powered furnaces to power the mills that made the city rich. And we're still cleaning up. God forgave us in Jesus Christ for our sins. He gave us a new start. You know, it's really time we got on. For some, it's making a new start. But for most of us, if not many of us, it's about getting on with the business of taking far more seriously our care for the world that God has given us and the wonder of his creation so we can continue to rejoice in the beauty that is around us and the annual return of spring and so on. And then the land need no longer mourn. That's a very big challenge. Jackie Wright. Has anyone heard of Jackie Wright? She topped a list for 2022 power list, did Jackie Wright. She's a Microsoft chief digital officer. And do you know, uh, picture who Jackie Wright might be as the chief digital officer for Microsoft. Picture the woman in your mind's eye. I'm going to tell you she's an Afro-Caribbean. I'm going to tell you that her father came from Jamaica to serve in the RAF in England during the Second World War. I'm going to tell you that her mother came over with Windrush. And I'm going to tell you that she grew up in Tottenham. And she is now Microsoft Chief Digital Officer. So from humble beginnings, great achievements can be made. And her challenge to, her young, to the young recruits in Microsoft was to leave the world, it is day by day, it is to leave the world in a better place than you found it. Leave the world in a better place than you found it. And I don't think we can do better than that, can we? We really can't. God's wonderful world, let's leave it in a better place than we found it.